Hi honeys, it's Michelle. In today's video, I'm going to share with you the books that I bought today. I have mentioned in the past that I want to help support the actual bookstores, Barnes and Noble and the local bookstores in my area, as opposed to buying books at places that sell other things because I love going into bookstores. It's a big passion of mine. I just, there's nothing like walking around a bookstore for hours, just browsing at books. I love it. It makes me feel very happy and inspired. It even makes me feel more creative. It's just a huge thing to me. And I know that everybody's really hurting right now. I know all small businesses are hurting right now, but there's a lot of bigger businesses that are hurting right now. I know Barnes and Noble is hurting and I love Barnes and Noble. It's probably for me, that would be my Disney world. <laughs> and I just can't handle the thought of these places going away. I used to buy books anywhere. I found books, you know, if I saw a book that I wanted, I would just get it, but I'm not going to do that anymore. And it's nothing against these stores, but places like, you know, Walmart, Target, Amazon, they get so much of my money from other things. They're probably not even going to notice if I stop buying books from them. But places like Barnes and Noble or other local bookstores in my area will definitely notice if I'm buying books from them. I had this feeling this morning, just this intuition, I guess, that my favorite local bookstore was open again. <laughs> and so I, I called down there to see if they were open. And they said that they were, they just reopened today. It felt like fate. So I decided to go down there and see if they had anything I might want. I would love to try to support them in whatever way I can. I mean, I know what I can do is very small. I'm just one person with a limited amount of money to spend, but I still want to do everything I can to help. And I want to make videos about it because I really want other people that love reading books to do the same thing in their neighborhoods. So I'm hoping that you will pay it forward and get some books at one of your local bookstores soon as well. If you've noticed something different about me, yes, I just got my hair cut and my hairstylist took uh, seven inches off of the back and he said he took three inches off of the front. And so my hair is super short in the back like I want I can still put it in a ponytail but you know there's not much to the ponytail anymore and I this is what I want to me this is the perfect summer haircut I can just relax and enjoy myself and not worry about my hair so much I'm going to do the same thing I did in my last book haul I'm going to show you the book tell you the name and the author I'm going to read the back of it, tell you what year it came out, and then if I see any information about the author on the in the back of the jacket, I'll let you know that as well. And if and I'll also let you know why I bought it. I think that's kind of an important thing to mention. So the first book I want to show you is this. This is Bioshock Rapture. I'm sorry about the glare. It's very sunny out today. Okay, so I'll read you the back here. Let's see, who's this by? By John Shirley. It was the end of World War II. FDR's New Deal had redefined American politics. Taxes were at an all-time high. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had created a fear of total annihilation. The rise of secret government agencies and sanctions on business had many watching their backs. America's sense of freedom was diminishing, and many were desperate to take that freedom back. Among them was a great dreamer, an immigrant, who'd pulled himself from the depths of poverty to become one of the wealthiest and most admired men in the world. That man was Andrew Ryan, and he believed that great men and women deserved better. So he set out to create the impossible. A utopia free from government, from censorship, and from moral restrictions on science, where what you gave us, where what you gave 
was what you got. He created Rapture, the shining city below the sea. But this utopia suffered a great tragedy. This is the story of how it all came to be and how it all ended. That sounds pretty good. This book is 429 pages long. The author won the Bram Stoker Award for his story collection, Black Butterflies, and is the author of numerous novels, including the bestseller Demons. He has written for television and movies and was co-screenwriter of The Crow. The Crow. I mean, I don't mean to age myself, but that was a good movie. The original one. I don't know about the other ones, but... Okay, and this movie... Or this movie... <laughs> This book has a copyright of 2011, July of 2011. So why did I book, buy this book, you might be wondering. <laughs> My husband actually wanted this book. I bought this for him. He asked me if I could look for any of the uh, Bioshock books for him at the bookstore. And I figured if you're going to find a book like this, you're a lot more likely to find it in a used bookstore than you would anywhere else. So I'm excited that I found that for him. This book is based off of, um, they have this Bioshock game that is on Xbox and PlayStation. And Brad really loves playing the Bioshock games and I actually don't mind listening to him play them. Sometimes if we're in the same room and he's playing, there's certain games I don't really like hearing, but this one, I enjoy the storyline also, so that's kind of fun. So I bet this book will be really good. The next book that I got is this. It's Saving Fish from Drowning by Amy Tan. I'm excited about this one. I watched the movie Joy Luck Club, when did that come out, the late 80s, and immediately fell in love with the storyline. I just thought it was so beautiful. That movie is what inspired me to want to learn how to play Mahjong. And I do play Mahjong every week with a group of my friends. After watching the movie Joy Luck Club, I was inspired to go get the book. And I read it and I loved it. I think I've read that book four or five times now. And Amy Tan is one of my favorite authors. I absolutely love her books. I have read most of them. And I've read most of them more than once. And when I do see books I haven't read before, I always buy them. And I have not read this one yet. So I was pretty excited to see it. I didn't even read the back. I just thought, oh, this is a book I haven't read of hers. And I wanted to go ahead and pick it up. It says, a superbly executed, good-hearted farce that is part romance and part mystery. Ooh. With Tan's many talents on display, it's her idiosyncratic wit and sly observations that make this book pure pleasure. Well, okay. San Francisco art patron B.B. Chen has planned a journey of the senses along the famed Burma Road for 11 lucky friends. But after her mysterious death, Bibi watches aghast from her ghostly perch as the travelers veer off her itinerary and embark on a trail paved with cultural gaffes and tribal curses, Buddhist illusions and romantic desires. On Christmas morning, the tourists cruise across a misty lake and disappear with picturesque characters and mesmerizing imagery, saving fish from drowning gives us a voice as idiosyncratic, sharp, and affectionate as the mothers of the Joy Luck Club. Bibi is the observant eye of human nature, the witness of good intentions and bad outcomes, of desperate souls and those who wish to save them. In the end, Tan takes her readers to that place in their own heart where hope is found. Well, that sounds really good. Her work has been translated into 36 languages, and she lives with her husband in San Francisco and New York. This book is 474 pages long. 
and the copyright is 2005. I don't know how I never got this book, although, hmm, yeah, I don't know, 2005. I have no excuse. <laughs> I think these things happen, though. You fall in love with an author, and you intend on reading every book they've ever written, and then next thing you know, some other book catches your eye, and you start reading other books, and you kind of forget to read all of them. That's, I think that's what happened here, because I, I, when I was looking in here, I see there's there's at least two or three other ones that I immediately see that I haven't read either. So The next book that I got is this one. This is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I have heard that this is a wonderful book here and there. I can't remember a specific person telling me. I just think I've heard it around. But then I saw on the cover that it's the winner of the Nobel Prize. And I just thought, why not? Why not? It's half price. <laughs> I'm helping support a store by buying it, and I love the cover. So that that's actually the real reason that I bought this. Now this book has been translated. The author lives in Colombia, and it says, 100 Years of Solitude tells the story of the rise and fall, birth and death of the mythical town of Macondo through the history of the Buendia family. Inventive, amusing, magnetic, sad, and alive with unforgettable men and women, brimming with the truth, compassion, and a lyrical magic that strikes the soul. This novel is a masterpiece in the art of fiction. Well, that sounds pretty good. So I have this fascination with ghost towns or oh, what are they called there's a name for them but there, there's certain towns especially out in this part of the world out here in the desert where they'll find that there was a, an entire city thousands of years ago and they don't know what happened to all the people that lived in the city and they, there's no evidence of them leaving but there there's no bodies that whole thing there's all kinds of just neat mysterious history out there and to me this seems like that might be what this book feels like i mean i know it's talking about a, a mythical town but it still sounds like it might kind of have that feel to it so i i think that this will be really good i'm hoping i mean it it did win a nobel prize right so i'm pretty sure that it will in fact be good okay and this book is 417 pages long this book was originally published in Argentina in 1967 and published in English in America um, with a hardcover edition for the first time in 1970. So this book has definitely been around for a while. It looks like the author penned quite a few other novels as well. So we'll see. Maybe this will be another artist for me to fall in love with or novelist I guess I should say although they are artistic too aren't they one of you will know exactly why I got this book <laughs> Fern Michaels payback the reason I say that one of you will know is one of you recommended that I read this series the first book in the series is called weekend warriors Okay, it's called the Sisterhood series. They didn't have Weekend Warriors there at the store, but they had the second one. And I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt to get this. I mean, it was probably, it looks like it was published a while ago. So I figured why not get my hands on when I can. I can always go back again later and see if they have more books in the series if I like this book. Um, and I'm pretty good if I read a book in the series that and I read it out of order I'm actually pretty good if I take notes at reading the first book later so I'm just gonna start with the second book and if I like it I'll just read the first one at a later date no big deal but yeah this is from the series that one of my viewers recommended it says some women get angry 
the sisterhood gets even. Meet the sisterhood. Seven very different women who found one another in their darkest days and formed an indelible friendship, strong enough to heal their pasts and bring their laughter and joy back into their lives. In Myra Rutledge's beautiful Virginia home, amid hugs and fresh iced tea, shrimp fritters and shell pink tulips, the friends have gathered to embark on their second mission of sweet revenge for one of their own. Julia Webster's husband, a U.S. Senator, has used his wife's graciousness and elegance to advance his career, even as he's abused her trust at every turn and left her dreams for the future in tatters. Now on the eve of his greatest political victory, he's about to learn a serious lesson in payback. Because the senator crossed the wrong woman, and there are six more where she came from. Then it says, revenge is a dish best served with cloth napkins and floral centerpieces. Fast paced puts poetic justice first. By Publishers Weekly. Sounds good, right? Now, this will not be my first Fern Michaels novel. I, I'm trying to think, I think it was in high school. At a used bookstore, I found Texas Rich. They had, she wrote a Texas series. And I think Texas Rich was the first one. I could be wrong. It was over 20 years ago. So I, <laughs> my memory is a little foggy there, but I loved that series. I remember the main character's name was Billy. I thought that Fern Michaels was a solid author back then. And so I'm excited to read this. I did happen to see if I enjoy this book and I enjoy this series, I might delve a little deeper because into Fern Michaels novels, I saw that she wrote a Vegas series. <laughs> well, don't threaten me with a good time. I would love to read a Vegas series not long after moving to Vegas. I think that would be really fun. So we'll see what happens there. Fern Michaels shares her 300 year old South Carolina plantation home with her six dogs and resident ghost, Mary Margaret, who leaves messages on her computer. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. This is an older book. Look inside. It's got an ad for a carnival cruise. I remember the older books, I'd say from about 2008 and before, always had little things like this where you could send in a little cutout and get discounts on books or vacations or what have you. I, I don't feel like I ever see that anymore. This book is 300 pages long and the copyright is in 2005. One of the best books I have ever, ever read, one of my most favorite, most cherished books of all time is She's Come Undone by Wally Lamb. I love that book. I do. I can't describe to you. There's no words in the English language that describe that kind of love, but I really do. And just talking about it makes me want to read it again, but I don't know what happened to my copy of it, so I'll have to go find one somewhere. I can't remember if this came out right before or right after. It's called I Know This Much Is True by Wally Lamb. When I read She's Come Undone, very soon thereafter, I wanted to read this book. And I never got around to it. Time just got a hold of me. And the next thing you know, 20 years has gone by. But I saw it today and thought this is the day it's going to happen now i'm going to get the book now this book is one of the most acclaimed novels of our time every now and then a book comes along that sets new standards for writers and readers alike wally lamb's latest novel is stunning and even that might be an understatement beautifully written and thought-provoking it forces readers to examine their own lives and views. This one is a masterpiece. 
Now, to tell you what it's about, I have to look inside the book. So I guess I could try to show you the back that or the front this way. On the afternoon of October 12th, 1990, my twin brother, Thomas, entered the Three Rivers Connecticut Public Library, retreated to one of the rear study carols, and prayed to God the sacrifice he was about to commit would be deemed acceptable. Okay, so this is a book about Mr. Lamb's actual life. It says, powerful stories of pain, truth, and hope created behind prison bars. He's an honored teacher of writing and a volunteer facilitator of a writing workshop for incarcerated women at Connecticut's York Correctional Institution. He lives in Connecticut with his wife and their three sons. But the first book that he came out with, She's Come Undone, if you have ever struggled with abuse or with mental health or someone else who has had mental health issues, read that book. She's Come and Done is so good. I don't think I would, I don't think I would have been able to pull myself out of certain situations without that book. That's how epic it is for me. She's Come Undone. I'm telling you, if you haven't read it, read it. Anyway, so I've <laughs> got this now on my to-be-read pile. The next two books are a little bit different than what I usually show you, but that's okay, right? We read books here. If you're watching this and you made it this far, you must read books. Either that or you just like hearing me talk about reading books, which that's fine too. You can stay. But um, <laughs> who likes reading just one kind of book? I don't think very many people do. I think most people are somewhat versatile, just like with the TV shows you watch or the movies you watch. You like a bunch of different types of stuff. We all have different sides to us and different things that interest us. And so these next two books are definitely another side to me that you might not be familiar with. Uh, so this book here is The Nature of Generosity by William Kittredge. 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 I don't know. Taking as his topic the ordinary yearning to take physical and emotional care, William Kittredge embarks upon a philosophical grand tour that explores the very core of who we are, gathering stories, facts, and verse from ancient and modern times. This master writer of the West travels the globe, figuratively and literally, in search for the truth about what drives us to live as we do, shattering the myth that survival of the fittest means survival of the violent or the cruelest or the selfish. Kittredge imagines a world in which altruism dominates and offers ample evidence that this is not an unreachable utopian ideal. Whether he's recalling his childhood in Oregon or touring Europe or studying photographs of Japanese gardens in a bookstore in New York City, Kittredge's synaptic connections are as unexpected as they are inspiring. From an early age, each of us tries to uncover who we are, and here Kittredge offers sparkling examples of the gems one can unearth when one digs in earnest. The nature of generosity is at once a natural sequel to his acclaimed memoir, Hole in the Sky, and an entirely unique masterwork. And then it says, synthesizes a lifetime's worth of fears and hopes for the planet. That was written by New Age. <laughs> that sounds pretty good, I think. I found this in the philosophy section. This book is 276 pages long. This book has a copyright of the year 2000. This last book felt like some kind of divine intervention or something. <laughs> um, ever since quarantine started, I have a newfound love for birds. 
I just love listening to them sing every day. I've been, I've always been someone who always has music or the TV on in the background. And lately, I don't. Lately, I've just been turning everything off and just having the birds on, but, well, just having the birds outside the window sing. I'm in love with birds to the point where I'm thinking about getting a bird feeder so that I can hear them even louder and I can look at them. I am a little bit scared of birds in person. Like if they fly past my head, it's going to scare me. But if they're on the other side of glass, I don't mind it. <laughs> but the other thing is I'm very compelled lately to meditate. And yeah, I feel like I know how, but I feel like there's a lot more to learn about it. And I tend to be someone who likes to go to a yoga class and then maybe meditate afterwards or do a guided meditation or something like that. Not that I can't meditate otherwise, but maybe I'm a bit of a newbie at it. So it was kind of weird when I was at this bookstore, I kept being drawn to books that were scattered all over the place, mind you, by a certain author that I've never heard of. His name is Ilchi Lee. I, I don't know, I just, I'm not kidding. Four different places, I stumbled upon a book of his in this bookstore. And the fourth one, I decided to take home. <laughs> so this is the book that I just had to have by Ilchi Lee. It's, it's called Bird of the Soul by Ilchi Lee. It says... Your soul wants to be free. In our busy, stressful, modern lives, we sometimes become weighed down with frustration, loneliness, sadness, and resentment. Life's problems, hurtful experiences, and our negative thoughts and emotions can close our hearts to the loving voice of the soul within. It is time to heal these wounds. Bird of the Soul helps us embrace our true nature and fill the void in our lives with the tenderness and beauty of our inner child. This beautifully illustrated short story of a young man named Jay and his relationship with his soul, symbolized by a sweetly singing bird, will inspire and uplift you. Bird of the Soul is a precious gift to help you recapture your joy and learn to listen again to the voice of your soul. And then it says, includes a guided meditation CD and a 21-day meditation journal. <laughs> it just felt like it was written for me. I mean, okay, my ego is not that big, but I mean, it felt like I was supposed to pick up this book at this time in my life and read it. It says, a modern day fable for reconnecting with your true nature. That sounds pretty, doesn't it? Oh my God, that sounds beautiful. Ilchi Lee is a well-respected humanitarian who has been working with the United Nations and other organizations for global peace. Lee serves as the president of the University of Brain Education and the International Brain Education Association. So in the back of the book, it's got this, which has two guided meditations, it looks like, or maybe you just go through the whole thing at once. It says, heal your soul, and then also free your life. This is such a beautiful book. It's like a, a gift that somebody never accepted or something, right? I mean, it was half off because it's a used book, but I can tell you that I don't think anybody actually read this. It doesn't look or feel like a book that somebody has actually read which is sad, but look at the beautiful illustrations inside. And then in the back, it's got that whole thing with the meditation journal. Yeah, I do. I feel like this was supposed to be my book. So this is one of those 
intuitive purchases, but it feels like it was meant to be. That is all the books that I got today. Thank you so much for watching. If you've read any of these, please let me know and let me know if there were books that you liked. I'm not sure when I'm going to get around to reading these. I just feel very compelled to help support small businesses, especially my local bookstores. And I wanted to help support mine, especially on the day that they opened. I thought that was very important to go down there and snag some books and help keep them going. Um, and I, I hope that you do the same if you're able. I understand we're not all able to do that right now, but if you are, I, I hope that you do. I'm not sure when I will be reading these books, but I will get around to them. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be this month or next month or six months from now, but I do have a certain section on my bookshelf that's reserved for books I have never read before, and I'm going to put those there, and I will read them when I feel... Um, drawn to do so. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day. I love you. Bye.